So our next lecture is dealing with thermodynamics. And we'll continue on with thermodynamics for the next few lectures. <clears throat> so we're starting chapter two. In chapter two, we needed to start defining some nomenclature. This includes uh, the system. Now when we talk about a system, we're talking about anything we want it to be. The way that we designate where the system is, is we draw a boundary. That boundary is wherever we say that that boundary is. The surroundings are everything outside the boundary. The system is everything inside the boundary. Now we can make rules for this boundary. It can be fixed or it can move. It can be closed or it can be open. Closed means that the mass is fixed. Open means that mass can pass in and out of the boundary. In a closed system, we can have energy transfer through the boundary, not mass. Here you see some nice illustrations. We see the a piston on the bottom right corner that is at uh, has a constant volume. We heat it. We're adding energy. Energy is passing through that boundary. If we if we assume the boundary is uh, the location of the gas, then that gas expands until it reaches an equilibrium point. So those were examples of closed system where the mass is constant. In an open system, or in fluid mechanics as we like to call it, a control volume we can have mass and energy pass through whatever boundary we set. The boundary, when we talk about an open system, is a control surface. So this dashed line here, we refer to as a control surface, with things pa passing in and out of that surface. And again, that control surface can be anything we want it to be. Here you see a nozzle example. You see a piston having flow come into it, and the boundary is moving. So it can be anything we want it to be. And we'll do several problems using these analyses. Another important part of this class is identifying the different properties of a system. Now, the property in the general definition is any characteristic of that system. There's some that are specifically of interest in thermodynamics. You see them listed here, mass, volume, temperature, pressure, and density. Some of them are dependent on mass, others are not. The ones that are dependent on mass or size of the system are called extensive properties, being mass and volume. Intensive properties are those independent of mass. So that would be density, pressure, and temperature. We'll use these properties to identify the state or um, the phase in some cases of what a system, um, where a system is in. We also have a new nomenclature here, specific properties. So when we say specific volume, for example, we're referring to the volume per unit mass of the system. And we'll be saying that quite a few times throughout these lectures. To establish some ground rules, we are making an assumption for all the problems that we are encountering in this class. The first assumption we make, or one of the many that we make, is that everything is in continuum. So what does that mean? Continuum means that when we deal with a fluid, molecules of this fluid, in this case uh, it's oxygen in this figure 2-7, if we zoomed in to the microscopic scale we would see that there is a big or quite a significant amount of space in between these oxygen molecules. 
What's in between them? Void. Nothing. Makes you kind of think, you know, if you get down to uh, our, uh, our own selves, what's in between the molecules that comprise us? Void. What percentage are we a void? I don't know. And uh, I think I'm just diverting from the topic a little bit. But um, in this case, we're assuming that we're going to neglect the void. When we say continuum, we're assuming that we, if we zoom out and if the system is large enough, and remember from the last lecture, we're assuming that we have, um, that we're dealing with macroscopic thermodynamics, classical thermodynamics, that we're interested in these large scale things. So because we're interested in these large scale things, the void is in fact much smaller than the system we're dealing with. So we tend to just assume if we're talking about oxygen, we assume that it's totally uniform. There's no void in between the molecules. Although in actuality there is. But for our studies, it won't make much of a difference in the calculations to assume that it's all uniform. Let me define some other properties that we use to describe a fluid state and in many cases a solid state too. Density. So density is going to give us the mass of an object per unit volume. The mass or the density of water is approximately 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. A handy tool to use is a specific gravity, which lets us relate the density of whatever material we have to water. So we can look at or we can immediately know if this object is more dense or less dense than water. Since it's non-dimensional, we don't need to worry about English units or SI units. You can see this number. Somebody tells you the specific gravity of gold is 19.2. You know that it is 19.2 times more dense than water at 4 degrees Celsius. We also will be using uh, quite a bit specific weight, which is density times the gravity. The units of this are newtons per meter cubed. This is less common than the use of density, but nevertheless we will use it as well. Specific volume is the inverse of density, and many plots that we have in thermodynamics use specific volume to identify what state that we're in. Let's also define what we mean by state and equilibrium. So when we talk about equilibrium, we're really talking about a state of balance. And there's different types of balances we can consider. One is thermal, so the temperature is the same throughout the system. Mechanical, pressure is the same at any point of time. Phase, when we have two phases, each phase reaches an equilibrium level and remains there, and chemical. We will be considering primarily thermal and mechanical equilibrium for our calculations. The state postulate. The state postulate is something that we need in order to fix the state of a system. In this case, the state of a simple compressible system is specified by two intensive properties. In this case, we have temperature and we have specific volume. I should also mention what I mean by simple. Simple means it involves no magnetic, gravitational motion, and surface tension effects. Now, in thermodynamics, we're going to look, be looking a lot at states. How is this um, engine, how is this boiler, how is this system? at state one and how does it look at state two 
what are the properties of this system at state one? What are the properties at state two? How much work can we get out of this system for, by taking it from state one to state two? Another important thing is how it gets to state one and state two. The direction or how it gets from state one to state two is called the path. So here you see another uh, diagram showing the path. A lot of times we'll use graphs like this where we have pressure versus volume um, to look at and characterize what has been going on in the system between the two equilibrium states. We'll also define different terms here that we're going to prefix with ISO. ISO basically means it doesn't change. So if I say isothermal, you know that temperature is constant. Isobaric means pressure is constant. Isochoric means volume is constant. So you can take that with you, and as we use it in our lectures, you'll know what I mean when I mention this is an isobaric process. We'll also be looking at cases where we have steady flow processes. In an open system, like the one you see in figure 216, we can have flow through a control volume. And again, the control volume are the boundaries that we set. When we say steady, we're implying that it does not change with time. If something changes with time, we call that unsteady. Makes sense. Typically, when we talk about turbines, pumps, boilers, different types of things that you'll find in industrial practice, most of them are steady flow machines. So in practice, we can assume many things are in fact steady. Not always, certainly not always, but in many cases we can. Here's a good point also, also that it's presented here. The temperature, and here's a good illustration between the two different states. Temperature at any location is constant in these figures. So the change in temperature with time, dt dx or dt dy, uh, is constant. Uh, is changing. I'm sorry, I apologize. dt dt, the change in temperature with time, is zero. We consider that to be steady. So again, that is a change in position. The temperature changes with position. Still can be steady as long as it doesn't change with time. So we'll first be introducing the zeroth law of thermodynamics. The zeroth law simply says that if two bodies, let's call them A and B, are in thermal equilibrium with a third, let's call that C. So A is in equilibrium with C, B is in equilibrium with C. We can also say that A is in equilibrium with B. So that's the zeroth law of thermodynamics. Another uh, way of looking at it is if we replace that third body, C, with a thermometer, we can say that the two bodies are in thermal equilibrium if both have the same temperature, even if they're not in contact. Temperature scales that we will be using for this class have to typically do with the boiling and freezing points of ice. If we talk about degrees Celsius, degrees Celsius is a scale relative to the boiling or freezing temperature of water. Zero degrees Celsius corresponds to freezing water. 100 degrees Celsius corresponds to the boiling point of water at one atmospheric pressure in both cases. We will be using the SI system, Fahrenheit system, 
typically we will not use. Another one that we may see up here is the Kelvin scale, which is assuming that the and, and measuring on an absolute scale. What does that mean? Well, at absolute zero, molecules will cease to move. As energy is increased in them, we should have some type of temperature reading. So absolute zero refers to a state where these molecules are completely at rest. It's very cold. How do we convert back and forth between these? The Kelvin scale, zero degrees Kelvin, is equivalent to minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. So when we convert back and forth between these, we can use this factor in order to know what scale we're dealing with. Reference point typically is uh, for our temperature measurements, like I mentioned, has to do with the boiling and freezing point of water. We can also relate it to the triple point, which is another new term. And this triple point has to do with all th when all three phases of water exist simultaneously. So we have solid, liquid, and vapor phases, or gas phase, of water. On our next lecture, we're going to be talking about pressures.